brother. You notice how fast that was, Ben? Take notes. Ben, today we are going to explore a very vast Harry Potter theory that spans all seven books and has thus far never been resolved or at least revealed to the audience by J.K. Rowling to have been in action. And yet it explains so much. I am talking about Dumbledore's big plan. Yes, of course we know that Dumbledore is always working tirelessly against the dark arts and gathering as much information about Voldemort as he can. Trying desperately to prevent him from returning to power or else just destroy him completely. And of all wizards, you'd probably think Yes, he, Dumbledore, is the man for the job. He is widely accepted as the greatest wizard of the age. He has already defeated the other most notorious wizard ever, Gellert Grindelwald, and is also the only wizard Voldemort ever feared, or so they say. And yet, after Voldemort attacks Harry and loses his powers and goes into hiding, Dumbledore does nothing to hunt him down and finish him off for good, even though he is certain Voldemort Voldemort will return. He has 13 years to act on this and maybe finish Voldemort off for good, but does nothing. Why? Well, we actually know why, and it's because of the prophecy about Harry Potter. The prophecy was made by Sybil Trelawney to Albus Dumbledore and is the reason Voldemort went after Harry in the first place. It says, The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches. The Dark Lord will mark him as his equal, and one must kill the other, for neither can live while the other survives. And while that obviously means a lot for Harry, the curious thing is what it might mean personally to Dumbledore. Because until that point, until he heard the prophecy, he probably considered it his personal responsibility to be the one to finish off Voldemort. But what this prophecy means to Dumbledore is that it won't be him who does it. It means it has to be Harry who does it. Harry is the only one who can do it. Or at least he knows it's Harry after Voldemort goes after him, because before that, I guess it could have also been Neville. But with that in mind, knowing that Dumbledore's ultimate goal is to defeat Voldemort, and knowing Dumbledore knows that only Harry can finish off Voldemort, Dumbledore finds himself in a very unique position. How is he going to handle Harry? Because since he's the only one who knows this information, does that not then also make him responsible for preparing Harry? Like what a weird position to be in. What should he do? Should he meddle and send Harry down the path he thinks is best suited for defeating Voldemort? Or would meddling send Harry off the path fate has already set for him? Because here's the thing, Harry's victory is not guaranteed. He can still lose. He's just also the only one with any chance at all of winning. So if you're Dumbledore, what do? Well, obviously we know he does meddle, but the question is how much? And the answer is the subject of this entire theory because the answer is a lot, like more than you can possibly imagine. Every mystery Harry thinks he's solving is being presented to him by Dumbledore. Every significant moment of Harry's life is being carefully constructed behind the scenes by Dumbledore as part of Dumbledore's big plan. Let's do this. Guys, this theory is so vast, we are actually going to break it down book by book. So today, we're just going to be looking at all the things Dumbledore was doing behind the scenes in the Philosopher's Stone. And this one in particular is big because so much of Harry's entire trajectory in the wizarding world is set up in the first book. Philosopher's Stone is full of Dumbledore's meddling and there is a lot to unpack, but ultimately I think Dumbledore had three main goals for Harry in his first year. First is to control who Harry decides to surround himself with and perhaps more specifically to just ensure that Harry doesn't end up in Slytherin. Second is to assess Harry's character as an individual. And third is to test his skills, bravery, and intuition. For Dumbledore, the Philosopher's Stone is largely about determining what kind of boy he's dealing with and how best to guide him in the future. So, first step, 
control Harry's friend group, and make sure he's not in Slytherin. And this starts right away when Hagrid comes to pick him up and inform him that he's a wizard. Those first two days he spends with Hagrid are crucial. They seriously set up a lot of where Harry goes for the rest of his time in the wizarding world. But one of the really big moments they have is when Hagrid tells Harry which house at Hogwarts is the bad one. That's not a witch or wizard who went bad, it wasn't in Slytherin. People get this point confused a lot because Ron says it in the movie, but it is really Hagrid who says it in the books. Which even as Hagrid is saying, it doesn't make a ton of sense because at that moment, he believes Sirius to have murdered 13 people and Sirius wasn't Gryffindor and he knows Sirius because he borrowed his bike, so you called out Hagrid. Except that you're not because Dumbledore told you to tell Harry this. And let me just say, there's nothing wrong with being in Slytherin. <laughs> But from Dumbledore's point of view, that is the house Voldemort was in. And I'm sure he doesn't want Harry surrounding himself with all of the Death Eaters kids the moment he gets to Hogwarts. I mean, we do know from the Malfoy family that some of the Death Eaters actually thought Harry might be a new rallying point for them to get behind. So you just really want to keep them away from Harry. Honestly though, I think while Dumbledore wanted him to end up in Gryffindor, I don't think he would have cared if he was in Hufflepuff or Ravenclaw either, just, just as long as he wasn't in Slytherin. And take note of how Dumbledore does this, because he uses this trick a lot. He doesn't guide Harry towards a good choice, he just guides him away from a bad choice. And Hagrid is not the only piece of assurance Dumbledore puts in place to sway Harry away from Slytherin. Let me ask you this. Have you ever thought it was odd that Mrs. Weasley didn't know the platform number the Hogwarts Express was leaving from on Harry's first day? Now what's the platform number? Said the boy's mother. Nine and three quarters, piped up a girl, also redheaded, who was holding her hand. Right, so in case you need a refresher, Molly Weasley has seven children, multiple of which have already spent several years at Hogwarts, if not their entire seven years at Hogwarts. Not to mention, it is also the school she herself and her her husband attended. And if my math is right, and yes, we did pay the math budget for this one, this is her 17th time arriving at the station for the train to leave. And yes, in case you were wondering, it has always been the same platform and the same train. There's actually an entire Pottermore article about just this. Point is, there is just no way she does not know the routine by this point. This theory would suggest that Mrs. Weasley is saying this out loud specifically so that Harry will meet the Weasleys before any other wizarding family. Which, yes, does mean Dumbledore would have arranged this with her ahead of time. And as we explore this theory deeper and deeper, you'll see that Molly and Arthur in particular were integral to his plans in terms of leaking information to Harry or else just watching over him. And if you're wondering how either of them would have gotten involved with Dumbledore when neither of them was in the first Order of the Phoenix, well, bear in mind that Molly had two older brothers, Gideon and Fabian, who were both in the first Order of the Phoenix and who both died at the hands of the Death Eaters. But but either way, the Weasleys are the perfect family for Dumbledore to surround Harry with. For one, they are all purebloods, but place no value on that particular aspect of themselves at all. And it would mean the first peers Harry would come into contact with would be a prefect, Percy, possibly the two most popular kids at school, Fred and George, and a boy in Harry's own year, Ron, all of whom are from a family famously in Gryffindor. Not that any of the boys would be in on this plan at all, it's just a good example of Dumbledore trusting that surrounding Harry with good people will yield good results. It's one of those classic Dumbledore guesses that are usually good. But indeed, Dumbledore gets what he wants because by the time Harry gets to the sorting, all he cares about is just not being in Slytherin. Not Slytherin. Not Slytherin. Which brings us to the second big thing Dumbledore is trying to accomplish in the Philosopher's Stone, which is judging Harry's character. And fortunately, he has the exact right tool for the job. The mirror of Erised. As I'm sure you are aware, the mirror shows whoever stands in front of it whatever is their heart's deepest desire, and when Harry stands in front of it, he sees his family, an image Dumbledore is extremely impressed with. In fact, in Half-Blood Prince, he tells Harry, Harry, have you any idea how few wizards could have seen what you saw in that mirror? And make no mistake, Dumbledore absolutely intended Harry to find that mirror specifically so he could see what Harry 
would see. Consider this, Harry finds the mirror on Christmas, the day he gets the invisibility cloak, which was sent to him by Dumbledore. And we know that Dumbledore was literally waiting in the room invisible himself in the middle of the night, like not even looking in the mirror himself, just like, I guess I'll just be invisible here. Back again, Harry? How do you know this is again, Dumbledore? How do you know it's again? I think he waits until Christmas to give Harry the cloak because there will be less students at the school wandering around who might then discover the mirror. Because the mirror cannot have just been sitting there in the open, findable all year, because it is very much the kind of thing that if people discovered it and started looking in it, everyone would want to look in it. And if you think, well, is that kind of a leap that he would give him the cloak, assuming he would immediately don it and roam around the castle at night and find the mirror? I don't think so. I mean, Dumbledore knew James and this was exactly the kind of thing he would do. But here's the other dead giveaway is, uh, why is the mirror up in the school at all when it's supposed to be like down below guarding the stone. In case you have forgotten, Hagrid retrieved the stone for Dumbledore in July and it's now December. So why is it taking him so long to put the stone in the mirror and the mirror in the basement? I Wherever this is, second chamber of secrets, they never explain where they go. What I understand is that somewhere on the third floor of the castle, there's just a hole. <laughs> like a deep one. The reason is because of course Dumbledore wants Harry to find the mirror so he can see what he sees, but also because of Dumbledore's third goal, which is to test Harry's skill, bravery, and intuition. I'm sure we're not the first to wonder why the obstacles guarding the stone are so easily defeatable by a first year when they're supposed to be keeping out Voldemort. Well, this theory suggests that the obstacles are the obstacles specifically because Dumbledore is testing if Harry Potter can break through them. And this isn't even just us guessing. Harry himself seems to be aware of this. He tells Ron and Hermione, he's a funny man, Dumbledore. I think he sort of wanted to give me a chance. I think he knows more or less everything that goes on here, you know? I reckon he had a pretty good idea we were going to try and instead of stopping us, he just taught us enough to help. I don't think it was an accident he let me find out how the mirror worked. It's almost like he thought I had the right to face Voldemort, if I could. But if it's true he set it up specifically to test Harry, you might be thinking, uh, wow, that is really reckless of Dumbledore. <laughs> and yeah, you would be right about that. But I don't think it's quite as bad as it seems. Because remember, Dumbledore alone has heard the prophecy and knows that either Harry or Voldemort must kill Harry or Voldemort. And I think he's reasonably certain that Voldemort's not going to be able to kill Harry unless he has a body back. And the means by which he's trying to get a body back in this case is by getting the stone, which Dumbledore also knows is 100% safe. It's 100% safe because of the enchantments Dumbledore himself puts on the mirror, which if you ask me, renders all of the rest of the obstacles kind of pointless. And by kind of pointless, I mean they do not need to be there. Dumbledore could have set up the mirror in Quirrell's office and left him alone with it all year, and he still wouldn't get the stone. But how do I get it? Why is he even bothering with the other obstacles? And the answer is to find out if Harry has one, the skills to break through the obstacles, two, the intuition to figure out the stone is down there at all, and three, the courage to face Voldemort. In fact, I dare say the obstacles themselves were chosen specifically because of Harry, Ron, and Hermione's skill set. Yes, I know that the other teachers put the obstacles there, but this theory would suggest that Dumbledore suggested the specific obstacles. But that is why it takes Dumbledore so long to finally put the mirror down there because he spends the first half of the year observing not just what Harry is good at, but also his friends. But come on, catching the key on the broom, that's all Harry. The giant chess set, that's all Ron. The potions logic puzzle, that is all Hermione. Even taking down the troll, pfft. They already did that. And if you're thinking, well, sure, he might've thought Harry was safe, but doesn't that endanger Ron and Hermione? Actually, no, it doesn't because of the way the potion puzzle works, where only one person was ever going to be able to go through. And I think he must've been reasonably confident 
it would be Harry. But it's not just that the obstacles are hand tailored for the Golden Trio skill sets. It's that Dumbledore is like laying clues all throughout the year for Harry to figure this out. Starting on that first day with Hagrid when he takes him with him to Gringotts to retrieve the stone. That right there, kind of crazy. I mean, the stone is an immensely powerful magical object that Dumbledore thinks Voldemort is about to try to steal and he just lets Harry see it be taken from the vault? Now, to be fair, he doesn't know that it's super valuable or even what it is, but he's very easily able to put two and two together once the Daily Prophet reveals that someone tried to break into that vault. Then there's Dumbledore's opening speech, where he says, And finally, I must tell you that this year, the third floor corridor on the right-hand side is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a very painful death. We've discovered a giant hole. We are also considering putting a murder plant at the bottom of the hole in case anyone does fall in, but I have to talk to Professor Sprout about that. It needs to be soft and springy, but also deadly, but also easily defeated. These are children. No, but this particular warning is interesting because Harry then asks Percy. He's not serious, he muttered to Percy. Must be, said Percy, frowning at Dumbledore. It's odd because he usually gives us a reason why we're not allowed to go somewhere. Yes, it is odd. I mean, if you don't want the students to go there, lock the door. It's locked. That's it. We're done for. And this over. And don't just lock it, but lock it in a way that is harder to get through than. Hello, Mora. And then also, don't even tell them not to go there. Like, who needs to be warned not to go through a door they already can't get through? Even Umbridge is able to magically seal her door against the likes of Alohomora, and that's just so students don't get into her office. This is guarding the Philosopher's Stone we're talking about. And those aren't the only clues by Dumbledore. I'll bring up the invisibility cloak again, which is simply a means for Harry to get out and around the castle. And don't even get me started on all the time Times, Hagrid lets slip a whole bunch of clues. I shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have told you that. Not to mention the complete lack of investigation or action taken after a series of other events that happened throughout the year. Like, how about in Harry's first Quidditch match ever when his broom starts trying to buck him off? Hagrid tells us only powerful dark magic can interfere with a broom, and we later find out from Quirrell that he knew Severus Snape was uttering a counter curse. And we know Snape is loyal to Dumbledore, and in Deathly Hallows, it's later revealed that Dumbledore actually told Snape to keep an eye on Quirrell. So, obviously, Dumbledore knew Quirrell was trying to kill Harry, but, uh, does nothing? How about the troll being let in? Quirrell later supplies a second troll for the protection of the stone. He's also the one to tell the school that the troll has been let in. <laughs> I thought you ought to know. Like, I'm sorry, but if you're Dumbledore, who actually knows all that information while it's happening, it is super obvious who let the troll in. Fire Quirrell. I'm not kidding. I don't know why he doesn't. He so easily could. And yet, Quirrell goes unpunished and uninvestigated even for the rest of the year. Why? Because, again, he wants Harry to figure it out. Just listen to this line from Dumbledore talking to Harry after everything's gone down. Oh, you know about Nicholas, said Dumbledore, sounding quite delighted. You did do the thing properly, didn't you? Well, Nicholas and I have had a little chat and agreed it's all for the best. Yeah, I think he sounds quite delighted because Harry went above and beyond what even Dumbledore expected in terms of research. And the thing he did properly was the task Dumbledore secretly set out for him. Even Flamel being okay with the stone being destroyed is kind of odd. Because the fact is, Dumbledore can protect it effectively. You put that stone back in the mirror, it is completely safe. My bet is that Flamel decided well before the events of this book that he was ready to die and just allowed Dumbledore to use the stone as Bait, I guess, to test Harry. But there you go, guys. That is part one of Dumbledore's big plan. Tune in next week for part two as we dive into the Chamber of Secrets. The real one, not the big hole on the third floor.
But in the meantime, if you want to catch up with us and discuss even more about Dumbledore's big plan, because there was stuff from Philosopher's Stone we didn't even get to include in this video because it's, there's just so many tiny things. Or if you have thoughts about how he might be pulling the strings in Chamber of Secrets, great news. We're going to be live streaming live here on the main Super Carlin Brothers channel this Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, theory talk this Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Set a reminder in your phone right now. We're gonna be coming up with all sorts of weird things Dumbledore has been doing to secretly guide Harry towards defeating Voldemort. Guys, if you'd like to go ahead and jump to part two, you can click this video right here, unless you're watching this in the first six days after the video came out, in which case we haven't filmed that one yet, but eventually it'll be right here. Otherwise, if you'd like to see how Harry is the Philosopher's Stone, you can check out this video right here. But Ben, until next time, or until this Friday, I will see you in another life, brother.